This is the rise of David too. If you turn to 1 Samuel 16 and 15, there's some areas I didn't get a chance to go to when we were talking about David last time. Where we ended last Wednesday was we were ending on the point of uh, the battle between David and Goliath. I got a little ahead of myself. I got a little excited. Uh, the, the preaching just kind of led me in a direction dealing with that battle. I wasn't intending on going there yet. So I have to back up a little bit and talk about the service of David. 1 Samuel 16, 15 reads as follows. And Sam, I'm sorry, and Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Which means that the servant of Saul recognized his master had a problem. He could see it. Sometimes we can't see our own problem. Sometimes we need somebody outside of ourselves to show us that there's something going on with us. Oftentimes that's a pastor's job. He can, he's not going to benefit from the direction that the enemy is trying to take you. See, your flesh will benefit from its talking, talking itself into trying to sin. But the pastor doesn't benefit from that or your brothers and sisters don't benefit from that. So that is why it's important to have someone outside of you help you. Bible says two are better than one because if you fall you need help getting up. Verse 16 reads, let our Lord now command thy servant which are before thee to seek out a man who is cunning, a cunning player on a harp. And it shall come to pass with the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hands and thou shalt be well. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you today for a move of God that's already taken place here. You've already blessed the church. You've already moved in a powerful way. We ask right now that you would bless us with the word. I intend to do some teaching tonight. I don't intend to preach too much. Uh, but, you know me, if the Holy Ghost hits me, I'm going to preach. Is that all right? Praise the Lord. We're going to go ahead and ask God to bless us one more time. In Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. Praise God. You may be seated in the wonderful name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. There's a couple of interesting things about this passage. <clears throat> I already explained one of them. But the idea of not being able to see sometimes the road that you're going down and you need someone else to point it out for you. Um, and that's why we need to come to church. That's why we should be around church people. If you're hanging out with a bunch of people who live in sin and you start going, going down that road, is your friends going to tell you, hey man, you're going down the wrong road? They're going to say, hey man, come on down this wrong road. <laughs> Come on with us. This, yeah, we're all having fun. Go ahead. Uh, you're not going to get the direction that you need. That's why it's important. I'm not saying don't ever hang out with people who aren't in church. Or you know, I'm definitely telling you not, not telling you not to hang out with your family. There are some churches that do that. I, I don't want to be one of them. Um, but you got to be careful who you're hanging out with most of the time. You got to be careful which direction that you're heading. And if you're with people who are going to help guide you down the right road and if they really love you by the way if they really love you they will warn you or remind you hey listen are you sure you want to be doing that I had a friend of mine uh, was giving me some stuff he was telling me about his life and I said well wait a minute brother there's something that I want to share with you you know I'm a little you know are you sure that's what you want to do that's, that's loving someone if you don't do that, then you're not, remember what did God say? He rebukes those that he loves. Could you turn that back down again, brother, the tape? Talk? So I'm here to tell you we've got to be careful about where we're going. Then it says that he was told to go find, let our Lord now command thy servant, which are before thee, to seek a man out. They were going to go find someone who can play a harp. It's, it's the wrong one. The one, brother, why don't you do, you know which one it is, right? The one for the sound. Let's turn it all the way down. Unless that's this, this little thing over here. No, it's not. Just turn that one all the way down, the tape one. Then you might have to turn the master down a little bit. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. That's the tape one, brother. Remember that one. That's until I get a sound person. I need people to remember that knob. 
Excuse me, ma'am. Do you think it's your turn to preach? She's like, praise God. She's telling us. Praise the Lord. So we have an objective. They've got to go find someone who plays the harp. And then he's going to be well. Verse 17 says that we're still in 1 Samuel 16. Verse 17 says, and I skip down. And Saul said unto his servant, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. He needs someone who's going to make him well. And his servant gave, you know, sometimes the servant knows what the master needs. Isn't that interesting? Now, I'm not talking about with you and God. I'm talking about sometimes there may be some of you that look at me and say, Pastor, you know, I'm going to pray for you. It seems like you need something. I'm, I'm going to, well, I'm not going to be like, hey, I'm the pastor. Don't you talk to me like that. Bless God. You better pray for yourself. Don't you pray for me. I, I, no, I, I welcome uh, the, the church loving the pastor. But here, the servant knew what his master needed. You know, how much time do you think that servant spent around Saul? I'm sure he was with him all the time. And so he knew what he needed. Uh, sometimes you guys are going to know what each other might need. You might know what I might need. You might be willing. You know, it was funny. I was reading something. Uh, I belong to a website that gives me emails about spiritual things. And, you know, it said when someone criticizes you, the first thing you should do, if you're the pastor, the first thing you should do is listen to them. The first thing, when you're criticized, as a, or even a leader, we've got a bunch of leaders that are coming up. We've got these board members that are uh, going to be appointed, and we've got leaders that are going to be voted in officially. I mean, we've got leaders doing jobs already. But there's going to be leaders, and there's going to be people that might come up to you one day and say, you know what, when you do this, X, Y, Z. Or when you do this, I don't like this. Or when you do that, I see someone being negatively affected. We've got to make sure that we're humble enough to go, because, you know, our defenses want to come up right away. Well, wait a minute. I'm in charge. I'm the boss. I, we don't want, what we want is to be slow to speak first. Quick to listen. Sometimes people around us can see what we're doing and can help us. Praise the Lord. So it was already ordained that this servant knew. It said in verse 18, then answered uh, one of the servants, and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing, mighty and valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in manners, a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Was the Lord anointed, or I'm sorry, was David anointed yet? Your name's, hey, are they talking about you? Is that your cousin? That is your name, huh? Did you know you're in the Bible? Did, now, Mom, did you use that name when? Was that your purpose, or were you just like Jesse? He did, because you're Jessica. And that's, well, you got a Bible name now, son. Isn't that cool? He's like, yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The Lord was with him. How do we know the Lord was with him? Because he had already been anointed by Samuel in the beginning of this chapter. He was an anointed man of God. Now, verse 21 says that David came to Saul and stood before him. Now, we skipped down a bit. So, we went from 18 to 20, 21 and 22. We're still at uh, 1 Samuel 16. And David came to Saul and stood before him and he loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. This is something that I wanted to, to bring to your attention. David loved Saul. David loved him and was willing to serve him. That was his whole purpose as the musician and armor bearer for Saul. He loved him. Verse 22 says, And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my eyes. I'm sure Saul had strong, it doesn't say that Saul loved David, but he sure had strong feelings for him because whenever he played, he could bring him comfort. Wouldn't you like having people around that bring you comfort? Somebody, somebody's always talking trash and always talking negative and always talking bad about people. It's hard to be around those people. But when someone is always encouraging and always, you know, Brother Yardnicek is someone who I like talking to. When we went to camp meeting, he was one of the day speaker. And I actually asked, can we go out to breakfast one of these days? And, and he wasn't like, oh, I'm the speaker. Sorry, I'm not going to hang out with you because I'm. He was like, yeah, you know, what day is good for you? And uh, he's just so encouraging. 
He's so positive. I like being around that. Uh, we need to be around positive people, I believe. And I'm sure that Saul, because of what David did for him, I'm sure he had very strong feelings for him. He asked Jesse, could he stay with me? Verse 23 says that it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took a harp and played with his hands. So Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him. This is the second time it was referenced. An evil spirit from who? From the Lord and from God, which is obviously the same thing. This evil spirit was from God. Isn't that interesting? From We already talked about the idea that once someone has got an evil spirit from the Lord, uh, it's, you know, it, actually I think this gives us an answer. We talked about the, the question of, do you pray for him? Because the only thing that can take away the evil spirit is God. God's the one that said it. But wait a minute. The, the one that, lo oh come on, somebody hear me. The one that loved Saul and, and, and played for Saul was able to make it so that that evil spirit would leave Saul. Mmm, wow. So I guess that gives us our answer, doesn't it? Yes, you should pray for someone, even if they have an evil spirit, from the Lord. Now, in this passage of Scripture and beyond, we realize that Saul does not become repented or converted, and he does die lost. We, we learn that. But if David could remove that evil spirit from the Lord, if Saul would have taken heed to David's love, he could have lived a natural life. Oh, praise God. This is interesting stuff. So we go on to verse, I'm sorry, we're going on to chapter 17, verse 22. One more thing I wanted you to see is that the fact is David's main purpose was to be a servant to Saul. 1 Samuel 17, 22. And we're talking about, remember, the rise of David. What made David so great? It was that servitude, that mindset of service is what made David so great. And it's the rebellion of Saul that made him so not great. And so if we're going to come up, remember we talked about, you know, going higher. We've got to rise up. We've got to rise up above the negativity. We've got to rise up above the nastiness. We've got to rise up above those things that the enemy is going to try to bring into your life. We've got to rise above it. In Jesus' name, can I get amen? Praise the Lord. 1 Samuel 17, 22. We're going to go to the next chapter. <clears throat> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Three. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to get to reading. 1 Samuel 22. 1722, and David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. Now, David was told by his dad, this is where we're getting to where he arrived at the battle um, where Goliath was going to be there and he was going to fight. I, I didn't get a chance to get to this because I jumped right to the battle because I got excited. Sorry, I preached. I got ahead of myself. He was told by his dad to go to see his brother and to bring some cheese and bread or wine or whatever that he had. And so he did so. He brought those things to his brothers. Verse 23 says that, he, and as he talked with them, behold, there came up a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. Those same words were every day Goliath would come out and talk trash about the Lord of hosts. Verse 24 says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. They were terrified of Goliath. And we talked about that. David wasn't scared. As a matter of fact, David ran up on him. And we're going to see that in the scripture. I said it, but I didn't show you the scripture. Verse 25 says, And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man? Oh my goodness, i got to preach. Have you seen this man has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. Which means he wouldn't have to pay taxes the rest of his family's generations. Verse 26 says that David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? 
and taketh away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, isn't this interesting? You got a little young buck over here like, hey, man, we can let this guy talk. We just let him do it. We got men who have, have been military, raised, trained, and they're afraid to death of this man. They are terrified, but not David. Verse 31 says, and when the words were heard, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul. So these people heard him speaking with conviction. And let me tell you what I believe it did. It stirred them up a little bit. You know how when someone says, man, we're not going to take this. We're not, yeah. People start getting, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're not, yeah. Why, why are we taking this? And that's how rebellion starts. And that's how, uh, you know, protests happen. And, but I believe that people heard this little young buck getting all excited about why are we letting this man talk this trash? And, they, and somebody brought it to Saul. Hey, there's somebody who's fired up to take out Goliath. <clears throat> then Saul sent for him, and David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and, and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine. You're but a young man, and he has been a warrior since his youth. You can't do it. I love using this for youth preaching because, you know, they love telling, you know, these big old people will try and tell these young teenage youth, you can't do it. You'd be shocked at what young people could do. This is what the scripture is for in terms of youth. Reminding, yes, ma'am. You have what? You do. Cool. Well, I like to see it. I hope it's, a, there's several of them and some of them are good and some are not so good. Praise God. Do you have it at home? Okay. Next time I come over, I want to borrow it. They got a whole library in their house. So he said, you know, you can't do it, man. You're too little. That, you know, that sounds like a voice from the enemy. The enemy is always telling you you can't. You can't teach a Bible study. You can't witness. You can't bring someone to church. You can't go up and talk to somebody you don't know. That's embarrassing. You can't do that. Listen, I don't want to ever listen to that voice that tells me I can't. Verse 34 says, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took, <clears throat> and took a lamb out of the flock. I don't know if the lion and the bear took them separately. It doesn't say. Verse 35 says, And I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of the mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. You know, that's the part I didn't have for you. Because I just talked about it. I, I didn't show you the scripture. David... Not only killed a bear, I told you that shouldn't be able to happen. A, a young boy at 16 should not be able to kill a bear with his bare hands. He took him by his beard. Can you, see sometimes we don't get deep enough into the word of God. Can you imagine a little 16 year old kid snatching that bear up by his beard? Get over here. Can you imagine and he smote him, didn't say hi, he might have cut his throat, I don't know what he did, but he grabbed, that's the courage that he had and the ability that he had to take out this bear. It says, um, verse 36, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be just as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Verse 37, David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he shall deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Now, wait a minute. I got to step one back and it says that they were sore afraid. They were sore afraid of this Philistine, right? Is that right? They were terrified. Of the Philistine, but David wasn't. But wait a minute. Who else was also afraid of that Philistine? King Saul was afraid. King Saul was the anointed of God. We're almost there. One, two. Oh, good. We're there. King Saul was the king. 
He was the one who had mighty victories. He is the one that God anointed. Did, did Saul forget about all his battles that the Lord delivered him out of? How many times did Saul fight against the Philistines and he won? And now all of a sudden Saul, is, Saul should have been out there himself. When that Philistine come out talking trash every day about God, Saul gave his, come on, I, this is even part of my notes. Saul gave his army, I'm sorry, his armor to the little guy. You know what should have been, what the, what that armor should have been? Should have been on Saul. That male, all that armor that he gave to this little boy who couldn't even wield it because he had no training in that. Saul had the training. Sometimes it's our responsibility, church. We want to pass it on to somebody else. Listen, God's already proven to Saul what he is all about. And he was afraid to do. He must have forgotten. You know, and that's very true. Whenever we get so anxiety ridden or so overwhelmed by a problem and we've been in church for any period of time and God has done anything for us, if we are going to freak out over something, that means we have forgotten. We got to keep in remembrance what God is able to do. What is God able to do? What is God able to do? Anything and everything, whatever we need, God is able. And if we are going to panic over life experiences, that means we have forgotten. Saul had forgotten who he was. He forgot who he was to God because of his rebellion. Last one, man, I tell you, that, that one hit me hard when I was studying this. I'd read it over and over and over again, and I never realized that Saul was just as afraid as everybody else because he sent a little boy to do a man's job. Let me tell you something. If we won't do it, that's why I also, this is good for youth too. I mean, I'm telling you, youth, if the adults aren't going to do it, guess what God will do? He'll find a bunch of teenagers to do it. And if the teenagers won't do it, he'll find a bunch of little uh, uh, crusaders like we got. All these seven, eight-year-olds. And if they won't do it, he'll go to the rocks. Actually, before, maybe he'll go to those ones this size. Because she'll, she'll praise and shout all day long. She don't care. She'll stand here and wave her arm. She's just so cute. She'll throw her hands up and go, ah! She don't care. And if she won't do it, then he'll go to the rocks. And the rocks will cry out in your place. If the men won't do it, if we won't stand up and do what God orders us to do, God will find somebody else. And guess what? Somebody else will get the blessing too. Oh, come on. You're not hearing me. Saul didn't get the blessing. David got the blessing. Because he was willing to not listen to the voice that said, you can't. Oh, man, this is fun. Verse 48, then it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David. David hasted, that David hasted and ran towards the army to meet. You know what? There's one more thing I got to show you. Well, this is it. We're done after this. I know I, I'm about 20 minutes in and I think that's good. I'm doing pretty good. Not only did he run towards Goliath, who was behind Goliath? The whole army. Come on, somebody got to get a picture. See, we, we just see Goliath out there and David running to Goliath. But behind Goliath is the whole Philistine army. And one boy with five smooth stones runs up on him. I'm sure he was probably looking back at them going, yeah, I'm afraid of you either. And when he killed that Philistine, what did they do? They got to kicking. They were gone. Running from David. They should have been running from Saul. Verse 49 says, And David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone and slang, and slang it, and smote the Philistine in the forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he, and he fell upon his face to the earth. One rock. Now let me ask you a question. Whenever I preach this, I wonder this. Do you think with the strength of a teenager by himself slinging a rock in a slingshot should that boy be able to sling it to the point where the rock goes inside through his skull do you think that that's humanly normally possible 
I don't think so. I'm telling you something. When he's, first of all, he, he, God's so big. You know what I'm saying? He sl- and God was behind the stone, church. God. See, that stone should have hit him. It could have hurt. could have knocked him out. But to sink into his skull, what did it say? Where is it? Sunk into his forehead. It didn't... Ow. It went through his skull and into his brain. That's the kind of power my God has. That's what kind of... The difference between coming after a problem by yourself is the stone going and falling down. But when you come up to a problem with God, it's the stone sinking and smashing through the skull. Can you imagine how thick his skull was? As big as he was? That should give us a picture, church, of what it's like to go up against a problem with God behind you. He fell on his face. Now, David doesn't have a sword. So what does he do? It says here, David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, smote the Philistine and slew him. Now, the the stone killed him. He was dead. It slew him, went into his forehead. Then it says, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine, took his sword. He took Goliath's own sword, church. Took his sword. Verse 51 says, Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, took his sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they went running. Do you think they were afraid of David? I bet you they were just as afraid of David as all the armies were afraid of Goliath. Wait a minute. See, I love what I'm preaching because things just come out. Think about it. Goliath, the Israelites, saw this beast and were horrified. The Philistines saw the 16-year little boy and were horrified. Went off running. Cut his head off with his own sword. Listen, the very things. Anybody ever heard of the story of Haman? Remember I told you, don't have Haman hate. I preached that message. Remember when he built the gallows to kill Mordecai? Who ended up dying on those gallows? Haman himself. Because he wanted to attack and attack and attack Mordecai, who was blessed of God. When you're blessed of God, people can attack you. You could take their own weapons and use them against them. <laughs> Whatever weapon they bring, no matter how, remember how big these weapons that, that Goliath had compared to David. This, this, the, the shekels of, of whatever, of this huge spear and, and, the, and the mail that he had on. 600 shekels of whatever. And the, and the, and the, the, the uh, shield and oh my goodness. But all those things, no matter how great, were just used against him. People can come at you with whatever they want. If you want to live for God, God can take those very things and make you powerful with those things. Let's stand. I'm just going to, I'm just going to dismiss tonight. I'm just having some fun. We had such a powerful move of God during worship that uh, it was almost like having an altar call. Praise the Lord. Uh, I want to encourage the church to, to allow that, uh, uh, operations of the Spirit to take place when the Spirit of God is moving like that. Praise God. Uh, I hope that you have gotten something out of today, not just from the worship, uh, but from the sermon, understanding the rise of David. We've got some more. Now, David's going to have some problems. We're just, we're getting to understand, you know, just like with Saul, we took our time to understand where he came from. Uh, we're understanding where David came from. And, uh, and now David's going to have some more victories, but he's also going to have some serious failures. And we're going to get into that. And, and the most important thing is to find out how David dealt with those failures. Anybody think they're going to fail between now and when they die? Raise your hand. Well, you're right, because you will. We're all going to fail sometime, somehow. And we need to learn how to, how to deal with those failures. Go ahead and just close your eyes. And if you bow your heads, Jesus, you know, we just love your word. We love your spirit. We love this church. We love each other. Lord God, we ask that you'd continue 
to direct us, to order our steps, guide us, and give us the, the very information we need to endure until the end, till you come back for your church. In Jesus' name, when the church said amen, somebody clap on to the Lord if you love him. Do you love him? Oh, I love God today. Praise God. I love him today. In Jesus' name, you are dismissed. Praise God. I kept my